Good, I think I can start right away. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is uh, Lucas, I'm from the University of uh, Salzburg, and I'm gonna present you about semantic querying in Earth observation data cubes. Um, first, I want to ask a small question. Who in this room works a lot with Earth observation data? Can you raise hands? Who would think they can get value out of Earth observation data? Good, uh, that's, a, that's a good mix. Um, so let me start. Um, first I will show a bit what's the current, uh, some uh, background, yeah? because we're talking about Earth observation data. And for some of you that uh, attended the keynote yesterday um, of the um, European Space Agency, you already heard that there is a lot of Earth observation data. There comes terabytes of new Earth observation data every day. They did a metaphor of if you add all these HD disks, that you get the height of the Eiffel Tower of new data every day. Um, and many of these data are actually freely and openly um, available for everyone. Yeah? For example, through the Copernicus program of the European Union, yeah, this, is not, um, th this is just open data. Everyone can use it if they want. Yeah? And because there's so much data and it's also often free and open, um, this is used more and more in different application do do domains that maybe did not use this type of data earlier on. So for example, hydrology or ecology or urban planning, all these kind of different application domains start to see that they maybe can get value out of Earth visualization data. Yeah? And they use it to analyze entities, events, processes that happen in the real world. Think about floods or forest fires or soil sealing or all this kind of stuff, green space in uh, cities. Yeah? So they are interested in such real world entities, real world processes, and to analyze them with Earth observation data. And the data storage and management and the data access has been greatly simplified in recent years with a new, um, let's call it um, technique, or um, yeah, which is called Earth observation data cubes. And very simply put, this basically means that all the different satellite images for an area, you store them in a single cube, which has two spatial dimensions and a temporal dim 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 dimension. And you don't, as a user, as an end user, you don't have to worry anymore about resampling of the data because it was in a different resolution or about missing timestamps or everything. It's all stored in a single um, hypercube and makes data access, data storage, and data management much easier. Yeah. But what we have to remember is that the EO data themselves, yeah, they are numbers. For example, they are reflectance values of um, specific radiations yeah, that the satellite captures. These numbers, these data in themselves are not yet knowledge about what we want to analyze in the real world. So there is a step needed. We need to get from the data to the knowledge that we want to ob ob obtain. And this is not always, always easy. Um, this is a hard task that requires technical expert uh, knowledge. Okay, so how this, this used to be, we have at one side the EO data and at the other side knowledge. So we want to go from there to here. So I constantly have to bend to, to get to the microphone. Um, Dutch people problems. So um, in the previous situation, there's one person there and he has a, or they have a toolbox in their hand, yeah, and this toolbox needs to con contain all the tools, all the skills to get from EO data to EO knowledge. Yeah, so this is data access, data storage, merging of data, resampling of data, knowing about processing power, um, interpreting the data, analyzing the data. The whole road from EO data to knowledge needs to be in this toolbox of that single person. Hmm? Now with Earth observation data cubes, this becomes easier because we get a data cube in the middle. And I said, the data storage management and how to access it is greatly s simplified. As the analyst, you don't have to worry anymore about that. For example, OpenEO, which is a project that does great work in this, rec in, in this regard. They create, for example, a standardized API that you can use to access a lot of different backends of satellite data. Yeah, usually this also works in the cloud so that you on your local machine don't have to download the data and make sure that there is enough processing power. This is all much easier to get the data. Mm -hmm. 
the access to the data is greatly simplified. So your skill set that you need, your toolbox, does not to need to contain all these tools anymore. Um, but there's still a gap, a gap that needs to be filled. Because in the end, you query this data cube, and what you get are still these numbers, these reflectance values, for, 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 for example, that are not yet equal, that doesn't tell you anything yet about this real-world entity, this real-world process that you as an analyst actually want to analyze. You, know, you have to give this meaning to this data. And you have to interpret this data before you can move on and actually do the, an, an, do the um, an analysis that you want to do. Um, and this interpretation, I said, is hard. This is a hard task. This requires expert knowledge in EO data analytics, and that is hard to obtain. Um, so can we not move to a future situation mm, where there are three persons here in this road mm, where the cube on the left um, is containing numbers, yeah, the reflectance values, but the cube on the right is containing what we call symbolic categorical data. It tells you directly something about that entity event um, process, yeah, that concept that you want to analyze. For example, it's a, if I'm an urban planner, which I actually am, um, and I want to analyze green space in uh, cities, mm -hmm. every location in space-time will, will, for example, tell me here green space was observed and here green space was not observed. This is a direct re re relation to this concept. Mm -hmm. And the part, the interpretation going from what are, how do we represent this concept, green space, in terms of the EO data, in terms of the numbers, that is done by someone who in their toolbox has the advanced technical Earth observation expertise. Yeah, this is the Earth observation expert. They define how do we actually represent this real world concept in terms of the data. Which means that you finally, as a domain expert, don't, have, don't need to have this skill set anymore in your toolbox and you can focus on actually analyzing the concepts that you are interested in by directly querying this concept from the cube because there is a step in between. And that is what we then called semantic querying. Yeah? So instead of querying the raw data values that are in the data cube, you actually query meaningful concepts that you're interested in and that have a meaning in the real world. For example, green space, forest, water, lakes. Yeah? Um, so how does this work? How does our framework look like? That looks like this. Um, I will go through all the steps, so don't get overwhelmed at first sight. Um, so as said, we have three different roles. Yeah? I don't know if this pointer works. Yes. We have the application expert. As said, this is the person that in the end wants to analyze something in the real world. We have the Earth observation expert, which knows very well how to, interpreter, in, to interpret Earth observation data. And we have the software expert who knows very well how to set up a cloud infrastructure with the data, data cubes, resampling, all this kind of more computer science oriented um, work. Mm -hmm. um, one point to make is that, of course, this pers this, these roles can all be taken on by the same person, completely fine, but it doesn't have to be anymore. You don't need to have all the skill sets of all the three roles. Then we have two abstract do 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 domains, let's call it, in our framework, which here on the right is the image domain. This is the domain, the abstract domain that contains the numbers, that contains the data. Well, on the left, we have what we call in the semantic domain. This contains the real world concepts. So this is a conceptualization of things that we see in the real world when we look outside. Um, so here we have the real world. That's in the end what we're all interested in. That's what we want to analyze. The real world is captured by Earth observation data. We have the satellites going around the Earth and they capture the, the real world. And then this data or numbers and they are stored in this Earth observation data cube. You can also have extra data in there, for example, DEMs, everything that can help the EO expert to accurately interpret this data and to represent concepts with it. Um, and the software expert is then the one that constructs this data cube and does the whole technical infrastructure, cloud infrastructure. Mm -hmm. At the other side, the real world is abstracted by semantic concepts. We have to define 
what actually exists in the, in the real world. Yeah? We have, I mean, we cannot really look out, outside, outside here now, but you see build-up area, cities, forests, mountains, lakes. Yeah? These are concepts that abstract what exists in the real world. And we formalize this concept in a um, so-called ontology. So in the ontology, we have a formalization of concepts that exist in the real world. And that can mean, for example, that we say um, a lake contains water. Hmm? Um, green space is made up of vegetation. Green space contains trees. All these kind of formalizations like that we define for ourselves what do these concepts actually mean? We define that in an ontology. But because this uh, is in the semantic dom dom domain, this ontology does not contain any data. We don't say at this point, green space has a uh, red band value higher than uh, 60.09 and you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah? This is real world term terminology in which we formalize what do these concepts actually, what, what are they? How do we formalize them? And then the ontology you agree upon by a community. Hmm? And this doesn't have to be everyone. This can be only your working group or your project. You say, we are going to formalize only those concepts that we are interested in, in our project. In my urban planning project, I'm going to formalize what is green space, what is build-up area, and what is blue space. It does not have to be a huge ontology which, de which will describe the whole world. That is too big. Keep it small. Keep it simple and keep it local. Um, and the, com um, the community that uh, will agree upon this can contain, of course, application experts can also contain earth observation experts. But to together they formulate, this is what these concepts mean. This is what they are. Then the core role here is for the earth observation expert because their task is to actually map these concepts that are formalized in ontology to the data values that are stored in the earth observation data cube. They're going to say, they're going to formulate rules that say, how is this concept, green space, how is that represented by the data that is stored in the EO data cube? So they bring in their expert knowledge into the system such that the application expert can say, I'm interested in, in green space. Yeah, it can write a query recipe, which we will come, come to soon, that says, I'm interested in green space, and that they don't have to know, hey, how do I actually represent green space in terms of these data values? So that is how the three roles uh, make up the whole system, and everyone does what their expertise is. And as I said, it's perfectly possible that one person takes on all the three, three roles. This actually happens quite a lot. But the key point is you don't have to. Um, OK, now I will go again through the different components. Maybe I repeat a bit, but let's see. Yeah, as I said, we have the, ont on the ontology formalizes the conceptualizations of real-world entities, events, and processes, uses real-world terminology, no data values agreed upon by the community, and keep it small. It doesn't have to contain everything. Um, that was just a summary of what I just said. The EO data cube stores the Earth observation data, and they also store other data sources like a DEM or anything that the Earth observation expert thinks this is useful to define these concepts. Um, and can be accessed with a standardized API, which, for example, OpenEO is very suitable for. Um, and it's not limited to a single software in our system. You can use Open Data Cube, you can use the file based system, you can use any different kind of software to actually store your, open da your data cube in. But I said that it's not the task of the application experts to set this up. Um, then we have the mapping, which is, of course, a core part in, this, in the system. It's a knowledge-based expert system where the earth observation expert brings in their knowledge about how to represent real-world concepts in terms of earth observation data. So they formulate rules that then quantify a direct relationship between the data and the concepts. And these rules can be binary, as said. Each pixel, each observation in space-time is just labeled, hey, this is green space. Yes, and this is green space. No, it's either true or it's false. But it could also be, for example, probabilistic, and where you say there is a high probability that this is green space or a low probability. And this is just what the Earth observation expert uh, thinks is suitable. They're, in the end, the expert in this part. Um, your rules can be very simple. You can, for example, say we have the 
concept green space. In the ontology, we say green space has a high photosynthetic activity, which means it's green vegetation, uh, which, would, which the earth observation expert says, okay, then we calculate an NVI index, and if it's higher than 0 0.6, it's yes, green space, otherwise, no. Yeah, this can be super simple, but um, to make it more accurate, they can also go more complex. Again, this is the expert knowledge of the EO expert that is brought in here. So you can look through time series of different Im images. How did the numbers change over time? Can we learn from that? Um, you can look at spatial neighborhoods, at shapes. So they can rule and they can range from very simple to more complex, de depending on what the EO expert uh, seems uh, finds suitable. They can also be hybrid, which basically combine, combines a knowledge-driven with a data-driven uh, approach, um, where, for example, you say we first run an automated algorithm like Google Dynamic World or some other thing on our data. We have a set of classes for each um, image. And then in the knowledge-based part, we further customize these classes, for example, merging them to really represent those concepts that we're interested in. So a lot of different approaches are possible here. Um, and then we have the query recipe. Mm. So then uh, the application expert references the concept that they are interested in, in my example, green space. Mm. And they ask the cube, okay, give me green space for my area in space time that I'm interested in. And they get some cube like this for each pixel, each observation has a direct relationship to the concept they're interested in. Then they can use array specific processes to further customize this symbolic categorical cube. They can, for example, say, I want to count the green space observations over time. That for each location in space, I know, hey, in this year, six times we found there's green space here, five times here. Yeah. So you can reduce it over time, over space. You can filter them. You can merge different cubes. Yeah, there are a lot of area-specific processes that you can apply to this queried categorical subset of the EO data cube. Um, and we named each of these processes by single action word, uh, verb, which makes it then very clear, hopefully, for the application expert what's happening. Um, so don't get confused by the next slide. It's just to show we have a lot of different verbs you know, that all do a specific thing on an array. The one I showed was the reduce one, which, for example, says we reduce it over time. We count all observations through time. You can filter. You can evaluate exp um, expressions, you can group it, uh, trim it, all different kind of operations are possible. For details, please look at the documentation, which I will share soon, or at the paper, of course. Um, because the final part, I just want to show briefly, I think time's still okay. Um, it's just to summarize the benefits, because uh, as I said, this, in our view, lowers the technical barriers for people to make value out of EO data because they don't need to have the skill set to actually interpret the data. Um, they can focus on their application. But also, I think it improves the structure of the existing EO analysis workflows, also of expert users. Because this interpretation, like what, how is this concept represented by the data, is defined only once in the mapping and not defined everywhere in each, and in each script um, somewhere knitted into other code. Yes, yeah, defined clearly in one place. You define it once and the whole group, research group, the whole project can use it and you can easily share it. And the recipes, they also remain constant because they reference relatively stable concepts like forest, like green space. So for example, when the data changes or when the techniques to interpret the data change or when you apply it in a different area, yeah, your mapping will be different. You have to update your mapping. But your recipe count green space remains the same because green space is still green space. That didn't change. The concept is still the concept. So these query recipes, they remain fairly constant. And you don't always have to update them when the data or techniques get updated. Final part, we did a proof of concept implementation of this in a Python library. Um, I will show very quickly some demo code, but please, there is extensive documentation, which I will give the link to also, which explains it in much more detail. But an idea is, for example, you're an application expert, you have to load a mapping, which is predefined by an EO expert, so you don't create a mapping for yourself, you load one that is predefined, 
you represent, you basically link to an EO data cube, which is set up by the software expert. You don't have to set it up for yourself. You only have to link to it. Then you set your spatial temporal extent and some additional context, like in what CRS and time zone you want to work, et cetera, et cetera. With this, your recipe just looks like, okay, I'm interested in the concept, in the entity water, and I want to apply the reduce process and use the count reducer over the, dim over the dim dimension time. But you see that here you don't reference any data, you reference a concept by its name. This concept is defined in the mapping, and the mapping can translate this concept with the data values that are in the, in the queue. Then you execute this and you get a map of, hey, how often was water observed over time in my spatial temporal subset? Um, so this is a package, it's called Semantic for semantic querying. Um, and you can find it on this GitHub link. I said there's quite extensive documentation, I think. So if you want to know more, please take a look here. It's open source, so the code is out there. Um, everybody can use it. And of course, we have a paper because the academic track where you can also find more details about our ideas and what we did. So thanks a lot. And now, since I'm also chair, I will check for questions. Thank you.